Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sumha Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sumha Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sumha Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sangang Namasami Most of you know the five precepts, the first to not kill, the second to not steal, the third to not engage in sexual misconduct, the fourth to not lie, the fifth to not take intoxicants. And each is precious and important and a great gift to those around us and to our practice, which refines as we hold these. But speech, speech is where so much of our karma is created and so much of the good and the damage that our lives can produce occurs. Right speech is uh, an important thing to look carefully at. And the Buddha spoke about four modes of wrong speech, to lie, to speak harshly, to speak uh, divisive tail-bearing, and idle chatter, pointless talk, the Pali Sampapalapa. That's a great word. Um, and of those four modes of wrong speech, there's only a precept against the first, not lying. And this is a caveat that the act of lying in the Buddhist um, picture is never appropriate. There is a power to holding truth at the most deep level of our being and always speaking in line with it. And this does not mean we always speak what's on our minds. It doesn't mean there's not room for skillful evasion at times of having to answer a question. But it means that there's something unbelievably powerful about being someone who your spouse can turn to and say, did you cheat on me? Or really, what do you think? And knowing that your answer holds unassailable stability in their eyes. But the other modes of wrong speech, the Buddha didn't put a precept against because there are times and places for these. There are times for harsh speech. Uh, there's a story of Mechi Geo, Mother Crystal in English, one of the enlightened, uh, or so they say, Thai uh, nuns who had gotten lost in her practice and was ignoring every admonition by her teacher, Ajahn Mahabua, to return to the simple act of her meditation object. And after time, he had to really get quite fierce with her. and as uh, someone who's been admonished plenty by senior teachers, there's, it's an honor and it's useful and it's necessary sometimes. So harsh speech has a place, um, but rarely. And similarly, divisive tail bearing, there's a time and a place where, say you really need to warn someone about something, or you need to talk frankly about a difficulty you know someone's going through. There's a place for saying, okay, you can frame that conversation and say, okay, I usually would not speak this way, but I feel I need to. Um, and then say what needs to be said as gently as you can, as n only what's necessary, and then that's it. And then idle chatter is uh, necessary at times as well. So many monks I know go to the monastery and come back for their first visit home uh, determined to speak only profound truth to their families at the dinner table. And it leads to very awkward Thanksgiving dinners, especially since we can't eat Thanksgiving dinners. So you just end up sitting there overly serious. So some papalapa, idle chatter, quote unquote, is not always idle. It's like grease on a bike chain. You need a little bit to move the wheels, but you do notice when your hands are covered in grease. So there's a place and a time for the other three, but lying, Lying is never appropriate in a Buddhist framework. 
and of the Jataka tales, which are largely commentarial, these tales of the Buddha's previous lives. Uh, a lot of folk legend from Vedic India got incorporated into these, but they're, they're really fun, and there's a lot of lessons in them. But it's worth noting that the one precept, the bodhisatta, the Buddha-to-be, never breaks in these stories is lying. He never lies. And that is perhaps because where we falter and diverge from the path again and again, what draws us back and what lets us take each of those failings as a lesson that refines the heart more is honesty, is having a clear view of what we've done and what we've done wrong and coming back home. The Buddha in the longer length discourses says, give me a person who is sincere, honest, and straightforward and I will teach him the Dhamma. I will train him. This is the necessity of a trainee, of a practitioner, honesty, sincerity. It's interesting to look into research on uh, compulsive liars who've really, it's been something they've done throughout their life and cultivated. And there's a, a very high instance of amnesia spontaneous amnesia in these people over time after several decades because, perhaps because, they've lost track of who they really are. A lie is not just put out in the world and allowed to incur or bring about minor ripples. It affects the deepest fabric of who we are because it's it's the clarity of our vision. And it's worth noting that the term for good in Buddhism, kusala, it's based on the word kusa grass, which was a sharp form of grass in the Buddhist time. And to pick it up caref correctly and not cut yourself, you have to pick it up with a certain technique. And so kusala, the word for quote unquote good, is actually skillful we are cultivating a skill in Buddhist practice. We are learning to be skillful, applying the Four Noble Truths, seeing dukkha in experience, letting it go. It's an applied skill. This is warrior knowledge, quote unquote, rather than just book knowledge. And similarly, to hold these precepts, to develop right speech, it's a skill. Because you can't always tell, it's not appropriate in every moment to tell the entirety of the truth in a certain way. And so to learn to hold these precepts, there is a skill you have to develop where sometimes um, maybe uh, if you know someone will be deeply damaged by something, there's a place for not saying it. Or I know one monk uh, who was at a monastery where they just built a new meditation hall and he went to another monastery and asked the abbot what he thought of the new meditation hall. And the abbot looked at him and said, have you noticed the statue right here before? We just got it put up. <laughs> There's a place for such things. <laughs> and it's good to prepare, you know, prepare yourself for those moments when you know that you're gonna have to find a way to speak to something. And this is not to put a stamp on, deceptive, uh, on being deceptive. Uh, but it's to say that to hold these precepts, you need to have this baseline level of uh, adhering to the letter, of not lying ever. And you want to take that ethic of honesty as far as you can, expand it into your entire life. Um, but also recognize that it is a developed skill. It takes time. And there are certain points where you have to become uh, skilled at how you speak the truth and how much someone can take, obviously. But this doesn't mean we don't really uh, ground ourselves in speaking of truth, always. And this can take an enormous act of commitment, especially in the professional sector. It's quite expected quite often that one will lie a little bit in their lives and in their careers. So there's a man who, uh, was a practitioner at one of the monasteries, and he went into um, 
the corporate world uh, in his, to his particular profession and determined I, I will keep my honesty throughout this. That is a core uh, value I will hold. And it took a real act of commitment, and initially he lost quite a bit of business because of that. But over the years, his reputation gained ground where people realized this is someone you can always count on. He always speaks the truth, and uh, that carried him. And similarly, sometimes speaking the truth when you think it will lead to a backlash you don't want, that's not always the case. We had someone who, in this community, who went into a job evaluation and was asked honestly about their hopes and dreams for their software engineering career. And they answered honestly that I'm really not that interested in a software engineering career. Because <laughs> what th the only other option was to lie, and they wouldn't lie. And what happened was their manager came back and said, actually, I think we can offer you a four-day work week. Would that be better? And it was much better. Sometimes these things come back in ways you don't expect. And if you find that you aren't explicitly lying, but you're going along with a culture or a situation that feels dishonest at some level, uh, it's, it's worth parsing out how much is just refraining from jumping into a conflict you don't need to jump into, and how much is genuinely caving in a way that makes you feel weak. If going to work every day you feel weak, disintegrated, when your body feels that weakness and exhaustion, that's not a good sign. That means you're compromising your honesty, perhaps on a deeper level. It's worth avoiding situations where you know that these difficult places can come up. Say there's a certain position where you know that lying is going to be expected. You step back. You don't go into it. And you can be honest. And people really do respect this over time, that quality of honesty. The second, uh, so the metric that the Buddha said for right speech or put laid out was one speaks at uh, a time in a timely fashion in ways that are beneficial and in ways that are truthful. Timely, beneficial, truthful. Timely, beneficial, truthful. So I always think of a clock, a uh, lie detector, and a big heart. So timely, truthful, beneficial, whatever order you choose. And this is your metric. And uh, there were situations where people approached the Buddha and said, would you ever speak in a way that was displeasing to people? And the Buddha said, that's not a categorical answer. There's times where you should and times where you shouldn't. Sometimes you need to say something that's displeasing. But those three other ones of beneficial, timely, and truthful are always applicable. So in a monastery, it's very common that you don't talk to people before the daily meal about anything difficult ever, <laughs> if you can help it. But the other forms of wrong speech, one uh, being harsh speech. And this is a very interesting one to watch refine because it's not the ethic of the world. In most of our relationships, sarcasm, sharp banter is uh, the lingua franca. It's, it's common. We speak this to each other and don't think anything of it. But it's as you practice, as you begin spending time with people who have refined their modes of speech, you realize that there's a, a real burn in those words, that they echo with people, that they're not necessary, that they're ugly. And this becomes a felt sense after you speak in a way that isn't kind, isn't appropriate. It will come up in your meditation. You will feel the stain. And this is how we refine and it's really important to be able to forgive ourselves for that, to understand this is the most, one of the most difficult realms of our entire conduct to refine. And yet it is through this realm that we can refine the heart because how we speak to others becomes very quickly how we speak to ourselves. And how we speak to ourselves becomes how we speak to others. So when you work on right speech, you're working on far more than simply a relationship with an external person. One quickly realizes the difficulty and uh, coarseness of cussing. Uh, Ajahn Jayasaro says it hurts to feel to hear a four-letter word in a monastery. It's true. It's true. It's worth giving up. And then just to really see how gentle can one be with their speech over time. 
Can you learn to quiet your, your tone? There's a real power in quiet speech. You'll notice in a group, sometimes the person who isn't fighting for airtime, but begins to speak very quietly, and this is practice in classrooms, is instead of yelling over the children, often you just speak quietly and there begins to be this steady calming. Sometimes, I've worked in classrooms where that was not the case. <laughs> um, but you, s you see the power of, of that quietness and gentleness in speech. And this is perhaps a good time to mention some of the monastic rules we have around this, where whenever we take leave, whenever we leave one another, we ask for forgiveness, whether or not we've done anything wrong. I do this with my parents, um, and I think it's a good thing to bring to a relationship, a marriage, a friendship, asking for forgiveness. And in fact, once a year, the Buddha made the monks ask for forgiveness. That's actually tomorrow, our end of the Vasa day, where we've spent three months together. And usually every monk will go up and say, if I've done anything wrong, please let the venerable ones tell me. And in Thailand, it's become a bit more ritualized, but there is a famous story of one monk uh, who, at the Western Monastery in Thailand, who spent the rains retreat making a detailed list of every monk in the monastery and stood up and just read it completely end to end. So there's a place for that, perhaps, but we try to be a little more gentle than that but asking for forgiveness. And then the quality of how we give feedback, not being harsh. And in uh, the Vinaya, the Buddhist monastic code, you need to fulfill numerous conditions before you're allowed to give feedback. You need to be pure in body, pure in mind, have a heart of loving kindness, be learned in the Dhamma, and know both Padimokas in detail, both monastic codes. Those are some hard qualities to meet. So I think one can take, for the sake of the lay life, a, uh, the spirit and the, the core of those, where one feels fairly grounded in one's uh, action and ethics, where one has a sense of goodwill that's essential, and one, where one feels they've established themselves in practice enough to be able to speak a bit to something that's coming up. But then there's five more conditions. One needs to speak at a timely manner, in the right time, honestly, uh, gently. Words connected with the matter at hand. And, okay, I've forgotten the fifth. I think loving kindness. Yes, loving kindness, from a heart of loving kindness. And I know one monk who had to wait a whole year before that was fulfilled. And, Finally, then one has to ask and receive permission from the other monastic. So these are really good restrictions to bring into your, your world because so often if feedback is touched with even the slightest uh, speck of anger, it changes the whole conversation. People can sense it. And often if you just wait a day or an hour or a week until you can come with a bit more spaciousness and genuine curiosity, the entire conversation shifts. And this is a strong wall against ever kind of just venting the spleen. And honestly, when you exist in a relationship with someone who has a modicum of mindfulness, often you can trust they'll catch themselves. Silence, in a, if held with metta, can be a very powerful mirror. So often it's worth waiting until something has occurred three times or so before you actually really bring it up. And See if you can trust the person. Harsh speech. The next is divisive tailbearing, gossiping. Anyone? This is something we work with. <laughs> this is perhaps one of the most difficult of all. It's so accepted, and yet it is one of the most damaging to be able to step back from gossip. Uh, Long Porpasno is known for this, really not speaking about anyone behind their backs. And you'll notice you lose the short-term sense of closeness with the people around you when they bring up the juicy bit of you know, gossip, when you're not responding in the same way, when you sort of nod and say, okay. But the long-term sense of trust is worth it, 
many times over because people know you just don't talk about people behind their backs. And whenever you have a friend who gossips a lot, you know they're saying stuff about you or you think they might be. And it just erodes trust completely. And it's so beautiful when you come across people who d do not speak about others behind their back. So this takes skill. There is friction with a lot of those relationships. You can expect some awkward silences when you say, oh, okay, I understand, or just are silent, or maybe even point out the good qualities of the person. If there's a relationship in your life where you can't kind of get a bit of distance, but that's a huge mode of the interaction, then a skillful means I've found, because there's gossiping monks as well, and one thing that's helped me with, with friendships like that has been to say, look, I really am trying not to gossip. Would you help me keep that? Um, when you hear me gossiping, would you point it out to me? And they connect the dots. They stop gossiping at you. So really single them out and, and, and make it clear this is something I want to hold. And it is worth it. It is such a powerful thing. And if this community is to hold together in the vibrancy and care which I think it is capable of, this should be, in fact, all four of these should be, but especially this and honesty should be paramount on everyone's minds. And feel free to have a conversation with people who you feel are straying in this, rea in this realm a bit after fulfilling all 10 conditions and asking for permission. <laughs> so the fourth, idle chatter. Does anyone remember the word? Sampapalapa, yes. Uh, Allison's also renamed this word idle chattel. I don't know why, but it works. We all appreciate it. <laughs> so it's very onomatopoeic. And once again, some measure of this is necessary. But one of the most interesting felt senses that develops as you practice is an embodied sense of the trivial and the untrivial, the trivial and the meaningful. It begins to hurt to waste time. Our speech is precious, and the Buddha says one speaks words worth treasuring. So what ca how can we make our words worth treasuring? And a really good metric is wait. Why am I talking? Why am I talking? And it were, it, it's helpful. I try to keep one day uh, of silence a week. Um, noble silence, we call it, which is where you say only what's necessary. You have to work with this in your family realms and jobs, obviously. But if you can avoid getting overly serious about it, which is why Ajahn Kovilo has renamed it Noble Smilence, um, it's a good practice to find times when you can pull into quiet and remember what that feels like. And then to recognize that a lot of people in our lives, they don't want to talk about the poly canon. And that's okay. <laughs> but what happens when you realize that right speech almost always can come as questions? Almost always, people want so badly to be heard, to be seen. It is easy to find nice people. It is very hard to find curious people. And I value that quality so much when I find it. So when you encounter the person in your life, your relative, your friend, who you're not going to be talking about the latest Vipassana technique or Bhante Analia book, can it be a game almost to try to find their Dharma language? Because everyone has it. The Four Noble Truths are hidden in everyone's heart. Can you find your way to what they care about? Ask them questions about uh, what's meaningful to them, where they're finding suffering, where they're finding happiness, and really dive into that and see what's there. Almost always there's something hidden. And at the very least, they've gotten to speak. That's worth so much. People would often ask Ajahn Shah how he knew the answers to their questions. And he said, if you didn't know the answer, you wouldn't be able to ask the question. So often you don't need to have an answer for your friends. You don't have to have any great piece of advice, you just need to ask them and let them speak through their own thing. And that's something people often have no one really they can do with, do that with. I think people don't realize as they become the primary kind of practitioner contacts in people's lives, how unique a place they soon occupy. It is rare to have a connection with someone you can talk to like that for many people in the world. It is very rare. So can you be curious and can you channel your metta that way? 
your love that way. There are a few suttas just to bring up here towards the end. One is uh, a wonderful one dealing with speaking divisive tale bearing where the Buddha said a true person when asked about another's bad qualities speaks little holding or does not say anything. When pressed with questions, he speaks little, holds back. When a good, a true person asked about another's good qualities, he speaks in full. When a true person is asked about his own qualities, he speaks, uh, he, he says very little. When pressed with questions, he speaks little, holding back. When a true person is asked about their bad qualities, they speak in full without holding back. One has to hold that with wisdom, but it reminds me of a, another saying uh, by a Greek philosopher, I think Epicurus, who said that when others come to you reporting what another person said about your faults, you should say, would that they have know, had known all my faults, they would have said far more, just that. <laughs> <laughs> and really owning it, you know, you sense that fragment of pride that gets lodged in people. And Ajahn Panyavada would often say, look, when you're struggling with that guilt, like, you know, you say something bad and you just find yourself chewing over it like, ah, but I needed to say that, you know, but maybe not. And, and you find yourself just agitated by that. That agitation is a sign of uh, you haven't come to your grounding in sila in morality, and often the grounding is saying, I'm guilty, we're all broken, we're all messing up. You have to hold this correctly if you're, there's too much kind of self-loathing or something, but rather this bowing and sense of humility and just saying, what do I have to lose? I could have been better. I could have been a little bit better, obviously. And to come to any difficult conversation being the first to apologize, because we've always done something that wasn't quite right. There's always something we could have refined a little bit more and that sense of humility is so moving to people. It means so much. The other thing I really like to keep in mind is there's a sutta where the Buddha says that if the Sangha grows into discord, one should, a monastic should come and heal the rift. And when other bhikkhus come and say, how did you do that? How did you heal this rift? Rather than saying, I came to those bhikkhus and I taught them the Dhamma and healed this fissure, one should instead say, I came, I heard the Dhamma from the Blessed One. I came and s spoke the Dhamma and those bhikkhus came into concord. And so this sense of steering it back to the Dhamma every time all these teachings we've been given, it's a gift, and we are just vessels for that gift of wisdom from all those around us, from the good people in our lives. This is why the Buddha said the whole of the holy life is spiritual friendship, Kalyana Mitta. So it's very interesting, like when people come up to you after a talk and say, that was a good talk. First, it's awkward, and I s we still don't totally know how to deal with it, but I think one a, a beautiful and true metric for dealing with praise is saying, the teachings are beautiful. It's the teachings. It always is. They're just, we rest in that gift constantly. So when we speak, each of these principles, when applied, can ripple through a life, and so much of your karmic refinement can happen right here. But also, each of these can be taken internally. Notice how you speak to yourself. Notice how that softens, how that refines, how it becomes more truthful, how you stop talking about others in your own head all the time. And what becomes internal, what is internal becomes external, and what becomes external becomes internal. And this is the beauty of refining our speech. So uh, best of luck to all of you. So we have some time for Q&A or uh, anything people would like to talk about? Matt, yes. You do. So. <laughs> <laughs> finding the advantage of this position. Uh, the a question I have is about humor. And you've been that 
um, run, or the, you've experienced a lot of my bad jokes <laughs> at different times. And at, how does humor fit into that? I, I, I realize that we have uh, a lot of humor in our interactions here, a lot of different people, I think, friendly humor and all that. Um, where is humor, like the little, the little horse joke, uh, the, the <laughs> pony joke, <laughs> uh, where, where, what's, where does that fit into this whole? It's a good question. Yeah. And one can read the Pali Sutras and come away with the picture of the Buddha as a very stern teacher. And in a certain sense, he drew clear boundaries. By the way, people could stand up and move around a little bit and shake out any tension. Um, but uh, Ajahn Tanisro wrote a book, The Buddha Smiles, about the Buddha's sense of humor. And the trick is that, and you start to see this, is that the best kind of humor is utterly truthful. It's, it's funny because it's true. I mean, with the pony joke, there probably wasn't a pony being examined by a doctor. Like, you know, you can, there's a place for things like that, I suppose. But often that domain of humor really does depend largely on exaggeration, on sarcasm. And you'll notice more often than you think, people take you literally. Like misunderstandings do arise, and there just begins the sense to be of this, like, that, that didn't quite feel right. It didn't quite, you know, the metric stops being right and wrong and becomes much more what feels totally beautiful and blameless. And it's fun, it, it really is interesting to see how much mindfulness you can bring to your speech. For example, you start to refine things around uh, speaking to impermanence. So instead of saying, I'll see you at the coffee shop at so-and-so in time, you say, I plan, I'll plan on seeing you at the coffee shop. Y you can go a little too far with that kind of refinement, but not, maybe not. Like, it's really powerful to see these small refinements. And I'd say humor exists, but it's a good experiment to see what happens when you give up humor that's, that's based on exaggeration and, and saying something that's not true. Pony jokes aside, <laughs> so my own experience with two of my siblings is that, that uh, there's a lot of put down humor and that you know can be uh, a way that people communicate with one another or it can be um, kind of a um, passive aggressive way of, of saying something that you don't feel comfortable saying otherwise. So I, I just don't know. You know. I think w it's hard to know the flavor of that until you've tasted anything else. That's, that's how people talk and it is accepted, and you don't realize how coarse it is and how it does damage over time. It crystallizes. Like, some of those jokes begin to carry real weight over the years, even if you don't always know it. And, and so that's the beauty of coming in the community where people don't joke like that, is you begin to see, like, that's actually not okay. It's not okay. Or maybe not that far, although some relationships shift slowly that way until the bantering humor is not banter at all. But the other sort of banter, you begin to realize it has an edge. And, you know, it's one of those things where with this sort of type of speech, it takes skill to be able to engage with someone who's used to that relationship with you and not come back at them with what they expect. And it's a friction worth working with. And often there is a skillful means, like a sort of middle way that's kind of imaginative and creative. Um, to avoid too much awkwardness. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd say in the Buddhist sense, it's, it's harsh speech and it pays dividends when you give it up. People begin to trust you deep down in a way that takes a time, time to manifest. But the fruits of a relationship like that take a while to feel because it's different. It's a different flavor. You know, so many of the flavors of Dhamma happiness, it's a more refined nourishment. It's like the taste of fresh snow when we're used to just eating Cheetos. <laughs> it's like you got to put down the Cheetos for a while before you can taste the snow. Okay, we'll just roll with that metaphor. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, who's online? Matthew, we're going to hold on for a second. I think we've, uh, these last two sessions, I think we, we got a question, so we're going to open it up to others if that's okay. Okay. Let's uh, have Jessica first and then go to Brian. Apologies. Please. Okay. Um, so regarding gossiping, I have a question. I find myself trying to kind of find this middle path where I don't want to be gossiping 
and when I'm with a close friend, a friend who's like Kalyana Mita or like a confession partner type friend, wanting to be able to be honest and share what's on my heart, even if that is, you know, I had an interaction with someone and it was really difficult mm -hmm. or things like that, just trying to, and then we end up saying, oh, but we don't want to be gossiping, wait a second, but wanting to be open and honest and real. So can you speak to that, that middle path? Yeah, that's really important to have space to do that. Because um, you're right, you need to be able to process the more difficult situations in your life with someone. And I think that's the importance of putting frame, very clear frames around any of those forms of wrong speech, except lying, which you never get to frame correctly. But with these other ones, um, yeah, in the conversation saying, okay, I think I need to speak through this a bit. Would you be willing to engage, you know, to talk about it with me in this way? And maybe we can be as careful as we can. And then, and you just have to trust your wisdom to guide you through that. But that framework, and if you're doing it with someone you can trust to not feed into it. Because so often, like what people, someone in our community got turned down from a job. And she said that this, how different it was talking to people in her normal life versus people in this community, it was night and day because a lot of people are like, how could they, those jerks? And she was like, well, they just went with, they're nice people. I mean, they run a nonprofit, <laughs> you know? And, 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 and I think you know those friends who are just gonna feed um, the, un they're not gonna feed the healthy parts. So if you frame things correctly, if you have a conversation with the right person with the right intention, I think you can trust your wisdom to see when it's straying. But you're right, you do need to be able to talk through things sometimes, yeah. Brian. Uh, Brian, I think you're muted. Oh, sorry. Oh, now you can speak, Brian. We just turned on the speakers. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Nash. And uh, my question is about uh, the difference between lying with malicious intent to harm others or lying out of compassion because you don't want to hurt someone's feelings. I studied these two British psychologists. They recorded everything people said all day long. And they found that everybody tells many lies every day. And sometimes the reason is they don't want to hurt someone's feelings. And I think some people can't think fast enough on their feet to say something indirect, which is not a lie. So I think sometimes it's actually necessary to lie. So I want to get your view on that. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, that's a really great question. And it's important to distinguish two terms in Buddhist thought of intention and motivation. So in Buddhism, the intention to lie, to misrepresent truth, always leaves a scar. There's always an echo. It compromises something in our hearts very deep, maybe even in an esoteric way we don't totally understand. The motivation for that can be ill will, uh, a desire for fame, for praise, and it can be genuine compassion for another person. But in the Buddhist framework, the motivation doesn't justify the intention um, with the precepts. Uh, and lying is something like that where what can seem like a white lie It's, I've, it, it's very difficult to look at someone next to you who you love and be, have to ask them a question that you need to know the answer to and know that over the course of these years, they've, there's been moments where they've stretched the truth or just planned out lied because they thought it was best for you and that you can't actually trust them completely. That's... So this is why we don't lie, is, is there's an unshakability in that truth. And there's, this is why it does take skill and learning. And you've got to prepare for certain situations and think, OK, what am I going to say if they ask me this? Because I, I can't, there's not actually a place to tell them um, this thing right now. And uh, yeah, and it takes some work. We mess up. But that's the goal, is that uh, in a Buddhist conception, lying, no matter what the motivation, always always leaves a karmic scar, um, even if less of a one, if it's kind of done out of care. But I, I'd say that you don't begin to see the beauty of someone who holds their truth unshakably until you've encountered such a person. And 
known what it means to really trust completely this person will never ever speak an untruth to me it's 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 unshakable so I, i'd say yeah that's my answer to that and i'd be curious if those psychologists followed like long proposno around for a while so <laughs> yeah please continue uh, let's get the mic um, I have a question about advisor perspective on dealing with those in our lives who don't uphold truth telling as a priority or aren't as authentic, uh, authentic or sincere, uh, especially as a community, if that's something that we're striving to do. How do you have advice or perspective on how we're supposed to interact with those folks who don't share that same priority? It's interesting. Um, Ajahn Chah said you should spend 90% of your time looking at your own practice and only 10% looking at anyone else around you. And in the suttas, one of the ways the Buddha says that you can tell if a teacher is restrained through fear or through genuine purity is by whether or not they disparage others and laud themselves for their precepts, basically. So all to say that when we first embark on this path and are holding these things, it's a huge act of will, and inevitably it leads to that pushing away and pulling towards. You do judge others. It's, it's just part of how it works. There's a pendulum. But watching that happen and trying you know, again and again to remember that people are on their own path. And in Buddhism, we don't proselytize. You know, it is very effect. People do see, uh, see you and your honesty and practice, and that is such a powerful lesson. So. I'd say usually just relying on that, keep your own practice, um, learn which relationships you need to pull back from and don't always conceive of it as a damaging to that person. Rather, if that person, if your relationship with them is predicated on them relying on unwholesome habit patterns like gossip or lying, what you're feeding in that relationship isn't something that's gonna serve their well-being. And in the end, what might serve their well-being is them knowing that there was this person who in their lives that they knew who really has this deep integrity, even if they don't see him that much. Like people don't need often another person to vent to or to gossip with or to go to the movies to. What they need when the divorce comes or cancer hits is a recollection that someone in their life had a purity that was beyond that. That's the biggest gift you can give your friends. So there's that. Um, like we said last week, there's a place for kind of bringing all those questionable friends to like a dinner once a month, batch the relationship. We There's someone in this community who came up to me afterwards and was like, I'm doing that tonight. I had it planned, like 15 people. So it doesn't mean you, you judge them, but uh, just to, to know, and that's the danger. So many of these things can sound arrogant and conceited, and it's not supposed to be like that. People have such, if we with all these teachings and meditation practice and community have so much trouble upholding these, how much you know how more, much more difficult for people who don't have those things you know it's just compassion so there's that um and and knowing though when is an appropriate amount of distance to get from certain relationships and um knowing when you need to bring people onto your turf and interact with them under your terms and then knowing when you have to have a conversation with someone in your life who is lying to you a lot and sit down and really say, like, look, with me, can you commit to this? And forgiveness. So, yeah. Does that help a little bit? Okay. I think we do have to wrap stuff up. So um, perhaps we could go around. And if you're new here, wait, blessing, blessing braid first. Okay. <laughs> 